So my name's Charlie Feldman. My Indian name is Prana, or Prime. And I've been coming to the Vedanta Society since 2004 or 2005. And I'm going to start with the song Give God the Blues by Sean Mullins. It's from an album called Mercyland that was compiled by a musician named Phil Madeira who wanted to have an album of religious-oriented music that was counterposed to the fanatics. Phil plays with Emmylou Harris, and he and I went to school together when we were younger. Phil's father was a Baptist minister. Phil also plays on this song, so can we have the song, please? Christians, but we all give God the blues. And God don't hate the atheists, the Buddhists, or the Hindus. God loves everybody, but we all give God the blues. God ain't no Republican, he ain't no Democrat. God's above all that than religion He's got a better plan And the sign says God's gone fishing For the soul of every man God don't hate the Muslim God don't hate the Jew I don't hate the Christians, but we all give God the blues. God don't hate the atheists, the Buddhists, or the Hindus. God loves everybody, but we all give God the blues. Swami Sarvapriyananda says, the quest for meaning is a distinguishing character of human life. We are meaning-seeking creatures. Humans are surely the only creatures who seek after the purpose of life and suffer from the perceived lack of such a purpose. Traditionally, in all civilizations and societies of the past, religion has been the primary source of meaning in life. So, it's, you know, when I'm home alone, I think I can answer all these questions, but here I don't know, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> we can divide the major religions into two main groups, the historical religions and the mystical religions. 
The historical religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam consider adhering to the history of how they were founded to be crucial to leading a correct religious life. One must believe that Moses received the Torah on Mount Sinai, or that Jesus was the Messiah, or that Muhammad was the final prophet. The mystical religions of Hinduism and Buddhism consider an experience of union or communion with the divine to be the crucial element. Meditation, prayer, and contemplation are considered to be crucial to achieving the highest state. While the mystical religions emphasize renunciation, the historical religions emphasize justice. This is not to say that each group does not have some of the other. For example, we see the Christian theologian Thomas A. Kempis encouraging people to renounce the world and follow Jesus. We, we see Lord Rama fighting the demons, and we see Lord Krishna encouraging Arjuna to fight for justice. Swami Vivekananda says, every one of the great religions in the world excepting our own, he's, he's talking about Hinduism here, is built upon such historical characters, but ours rests upon principles. But what care they, these sages, for their names? They are the preachers of, pre preachers of principles, and they themselves, so far as they went, tried to become, become illustrations of the principles they preached. A search for justice has been emphasized in the historical religions. Judaism considers tikkun olam, or repair of the world, to be a goal of observant Jews. Tikkun olam is considered a way of hastening the coming of the Messiah. For many Orthodox Jews, as well as Christian Zionists, restoring Israel to its biblical dimensions has resulted in endless conflict in the Middle East or contributed to it. Both Catholicism and various branches of Protestantism have enforced religious laws at times, going so far as to imprison, torture, and kill those who did not live up to these laws. I think I'm torturing Richard right now, or else his back is hurting, one of the two. <laughs> Examples are the Catholic Inquisition and the Puritans right next door in Massachusetts in colonial times. Islam has enforced Sharia or Islamic law to pursue its vision of justice. Some Islamic groups, though not representative of the majority, have recently used terrorism to make their points. Yet Swami Mahayogananda quotes, quotes Swami Saragananda in an article in the Vedanta Keshari. We suffer as a result of our own actions. It is unfair to blame anybody else for it. We have to surrender ourselves completely to the Lord with faith and devotion, serve others to the best of our capacity, and never be a source of sorrow to anybody. Swami Mahayogananda gives the following example of equanimity. Holy Mother was surrounded by quarrelsome relatives who were steeped in worldliness and interested specifically in money and status. It is amazing to see how, in these challenging circumstances, the mother never lost her balance, poise, or equanimity. He goes on to quote the Holy Mother, a person, first of all, must make his own mind guilty, and then alone he can see another person's guilt. Sri Ramakrishna says in the Gospel, Bad people may abuse you very much and speak ill of you, but you must bear with them all if you sincerely seek God. Isn't it possible to think of God in the midst of the wicked? Just think of the rishis of ancient times. They used to meditate on God in the forest, surrounded on all sides by tigers, bears, and other ferocious beasts. Wicked men have the nature of tigers and bears. They will pursue you to do you an injury. The mystical religions have usually not gone as far to, to force, gone so far as to force anyone to adhere to their religions. Hinduism until modern times has had few missionaries and Buddhist missionaries were overwhelmingly peaceful. The major mystical view of justice includes the belief in dharma, karma, and reincarnation, which means living righteously and always getting what we deserve based on how we live our lives. John Lennon had a song called Instant Karma, 
which was an ironic view that raised the question of why we don't get the results of our good and bad actions right away. That way, we would all be good because we would all have an immediate incentive. The answer to this seems to be that in the world of duality, we are constrained to have a mixture of good and bad, which are ultimately always in balance. Then the question becomes, why do good? The answer to this is that it's our nature to want to do good. Swami Vivekananda says that the thief that robs and the yogi that meditates are both expressing love in their own ways. The difference is that the thief is doing it in a way that will bring unhappiness, and the yogi is doing it in a way that will bring ultimate happiness. It seems that pursuing justice can lead to an attempt to have everyone conform to a certain standard. In India, the caste system did this, but while people were constrained socially, they were not as much constrained in terms of their religious beliefs and practices. Swami Sarvapriyananda says, one of the problems with traditional religions and the reason why mo the modern individual rejects them is that they usually call for an unquestioning, unwavering faith. A couple of words on religious sectarianism. Swami Ganeshananda from Germany, I believe, tells the story. Two children were quarreling over something and weeping. The mom of one of them interfered, or I guess he means intervened. Her child said, Mom, she says that her mom is the best, but I say that my mom is the best. Mom smiled and said, my dears, both of you are right and wrong at the same time. Both of you should say, my mom is the best for me. And I, really, I find that really impressive if you extrapolate that to deal with religions. A song to the mother in the gospel says, Jesus, Buddha, Moses, Garanga, all are drunk with the wine of love. O oh, mother, when shall I be blessed by joining in their blissful company? Swami Vivekananda says, I shall go to the mosque of the Muslim. I shall enter the Christian church and kneel before the crucifix. I shall enter the Buddhist temple where I shall take refuge in the Buddha and his, in his law. I shall go to the forest and sit down in meditation with the Hindu who is trying to see the light which enlightens the heart of everyone. Not only shall I do all these, but I shall keep my heart open for all that may come in the future. Swami Vivekananda also says, the West says we minimize evil by conquering it. India says we destroy evil by suffering. Until evil is nothing to us, it becomes positive enjoyment. Swamiji says we can learn, the East and the West can learn from each other's points of view. A few centuries ago, the world was shaken up by the industrial and scientific revolutions with major changes affecting people's religious beliefs. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, most people knew only the local community in which they had grown up, and they knew only their local religion. Faith came naturally. In the Industrial Revolution, society was shaken up through the discovery of scientific laws that seemed to explain things in the world that religion had formerly explained. Here, and even prior to this, there was a process called the disenchantment of the world. Tribal people thought each force of nature was controlled by a spirit or a god. With the advent of monotheism, the multiplicity of spirits and gods was replaced by one god. Then in the modern age, the idea arose that natural phenomena could be explained without recourse to the idea of God at all. The philosophical upheaval in Europe was known as the European Enlightenment. There were three major ideals put forth in the European Enlightenment, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Fraternity has lately been called solidarity, to be gender neutral, I believe. We can see that these three ideals are the archetypal ideals of all politics with every political tendency adhering to one or more of them. The group that supports liberty exclusively with no equality or solidarity is called the libertarian movement. 
Its ideal is untrammeled liberty with no constraints on anyone's individual initiative. People would be allowed to do anything as long as they don't get in the way of someone else's liberty. Libertarians have never had fully had sway in society because when there is political freedom, labor unions, churches, and others have introduced some equality and solidarity into society. When liberty has gained the upper hand, the so-called free market has been given full sway. Even though workers are not allowed to freely move from country to country to get the best deal, corporations can move anywhere in the world to get the best deal for themselves. As a result, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. People starve each day in poorer countries. The main drawback of the libertarian movement is that it results in greed. Now, the political tendencies that stand up the most for exclusively, by the way, you may be wondering why I'm talking about these, but you'll see in the end why I'm bringing these up. The political tendencies that stand up the most for exclusive equality with no liberty or solidarity in practice are socialism and communism. The difference is that the democratic socialists want to achieve equality through democracy. So like the libertarians in a democratic socialist society, the socialists don't get all they want. There is some degree of liberty and solidarity holding equality in check. The communists force their view of equality on society. Even though in the philosophy of Marx and Lenin, the state is supposed to wither away, in every existing communist country, anger has been the main drawback of the pursuit of equality. Millions of people have been jailed and killed in communist countries in the name of equality. Communism seeks a classless society where no individuals will own the means of production, but rather they will be owned by the people themselves. Due to the existence of real or imagined counter-revolutionaries who threaten the communist project, anyone who disagrees with the leadership may become a victim of political repression and anger. The ones who favor exclusive solidarity with no liberty or equality are those who want to go back to the way society was before the Industrial Revolution with either the church or empire or both ruling. I call them reactionaries because this is a reaction to the modern age. There are two types of pure reactionaries. One type is the imperialist nationalists the other is the religious fundamentalists when they become theocrats. An extreme example of the imperialist nationalists is the Nazis. The solidarity of the Nazis is based on everyone being the same version of the same nationality. You couldn't just be any German. You had to be white, heterosexual, of Christian origins, and not considered to have a disability. All other Germans and all other nationalities were considered to be inferior. The major drawback of the pursuit of solidarity is pride. Ironically, the religions that produced the most religious fundamentalists started off with the idea of humility before God. The exodus of the Jews from Egypt was the exodus of a slave people um, who were at the bottom of Egyptian society. Jesus was the son of a carpenter. In the Christian New Testament, it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. Islam started off as a surrender to God, which is the meaning of Islam. Islam started off as an opposition movement to the arrogance and infighting of the existing Arab societies. Yet today, fundamentalists of all three of these religions have the pride of thinking they are superior and that the only ones who deserve to have rights are the ones who embrace their version of their religion. All other versions of their religion and all other religions are considered fair game for exploitation and repression. One other tendency to consider is the anarchists who want 100% liberty, 100% equality, and 100% solidarity all at the same time. Under anarchism, there would be neither government nor money. The anarchists are perhaps the highest political idealists of all. 
They blame hierarchies and government and the corporations for society's problems. We would all have to be saints for anarchism to work. The business people in a libertarian society, the political bureaucrats in a communist society, and the social or religious leaders in a reactionary society would also all have to be saints for those forms of society to work without greed, anger, or pride causing oppression. An anarchist, a libertarian, a communist, and a reactionary decide to go out for the evening. No sooner did they reach their destination and get seated than a fight broke out. The reason is they went to a hockey game. <laughs> Swamiji did tell me to tell a few jokes. <laughs> So far, we have seen that the three ideals of the European Enlightenment, liberty, equality, and solidarity, lead respectively to greed, anger, and pride. What are greed, anger, and pride? They are very similar to what are called the three poisons in Buddhism. They are regarded as being the three causes of suffering in the world. Greed implies a lack of money. Anger implies a lack of power. Pride implies a lack of self-esteem. Rather than railing at greed, anger, and pride in others, it is better to see them as aspects of the ego in which the person feels that they are lacking something. This lack can only be filled from within. Can we have a society of saints? A look at the Hindu caste system might tell us something about human nature. The shudras, or the working class, are the ones who stand behind socialism and communism. They're the ones who are likely to use anger to advance their cause. The Vaishas, or business people, create the libertarian movement. They are likely to engage in greed to get ahead. The Kshatriyas, the organizers, or the political and warrior class, want to control society and thus are the backbone of the reactionary movements. They are likely to have pride as their modus operandi. Some Brahmins who are the clergy may also want control, but the Brahmins who are the ideal Brahmins can get along without government and money, so they could be the anarchists. Their goal would be to renounce the world and live in harmony with everyone. Only the ideal Brahmins would be saints, while the workers, business people, and political and social leaders would be jockeying for position. Does this mean there is no political solution? Does this mean we have to give up our ideals? While the anarchists seek complete liberty, equality, and solidarity, there is another way to deal with all three ideals. This is to have a balance of the ideals, which would also be a balance of power and a balance of authority. When we balance liberty, equality, and solidarity, we get democracy or perhaps social democracy. The workers and business people get along in relative harmony, the public and government officials get along in relative harmony, and the different religions and nationalities get along in relative harmony. There is a degree of liberty, equality, and solidarity, all three existing together and they balance each other out. The four social classes compete with each other and attain a peaceful coexistence. There is a balance of authority in that both political and economic authorities exist, meaning the government and the business people. Um, but both can be opposed through opposition political parties, protest movements, labor unions, and social programs to redistribute the wealth. But this is only a balance or compromise, and it is difficult to maintain. People still need an ideal to live by, and while libertarians, communists, reactionaries, and anarchists all have the right to present their cases in a democracy. We have found that these ideals all have their drawbacks. It seems that in the search for justice, we encounter a choice between the fanaticism of a sectarian ideal or having no ideal at all and settling for an eternal compromise. We will explore this issue in a little bit. Swami Yogatmanandaji told me that the job of social leaders should be directed at the reduction and, if possible, elimination of privileges while preserving variety. This can be done by having people who earn more money paying higher taxes and having special programs for the disabled and senior citizens. The power of the state can, at least in theory, 
be equally shared by everyone, no matter how rich, skilled, or resourceful they are. In more socialistic countries, distribution is more equal, but can lead to a lack of incentive. As people grow in the feeling of oneself in all bodies, there is more chance of coming closer to the ideal. It may not ever be possible to come to this ideal state as a society, but an individual can. The individual can be the beacon of light for others to follow at their own pace. And that is Swami Yogatmanandaji's reply to some of my political questions. Swami Yogatmanandaji also suggested I read about Kierkegaard for this talk. A reaction to the modern age was the existentialist tendency in philosophy. Although later existentialists were mostly atheists, one of the first existentialists was Soren Kierkegaard. I was not too familiar with Kierkegaard before I started doing research for this talk, but I have found that he has a lot of ideas that are similar to Vedanta. I have taken this information from a book of Kierkegaard's writings and aphorisms called Provocations, Spiritual Writings of Kierkegaard, compiled <coughs> and edited by Charles E. Moore. <clears throat> Kierkegaard said that Christianity is not so much about transforming the intellect as it is about transforming the will. He felt that the relationship to Christ is the decisive thing. Christianity did not come to inculcate heroic virtues in the individual, but to remove selfishness. In fact, he felt that Christ was crucified because he refused to be selfish. In reaction to our mass society, Kierkegaard felt that we must fear God instead of fearing the crowd. He felt that fear is the most dangerous tyranny. Unconditional commitment to Christ means dying to the world. Doubt cannot be halted by reasons which only nourish doubt, but by imitation. Kierkegaard felt that it was good that philosophers like Feuerbach who was an atheist, were calling Christians to task for not living up to what they believed in. He felt that it is silly to be upset if one gospel writer says one thing and a second another. He encouraged people to turn to Christ and say, this disturbs me, yet you are still with me. The thing to do is to find an idea for which one can live and die. Kierkegaard felt that it is necessary to act when the understanding says there is more than one possible path. He felt that the understanding wants us to keep deliberating endlessly. In what might be considered countering today's fundamentalism, he said that God will be just as severe with us as we are with others. Spiritual progress is doing freely what one was once compelled to do. In fact, he said that the opposite of freedom is not necessity, but guilt. Kierkegaard encourages us to turn inward to find our relationship with God. Kierkegaard was not a non-dualist, though, because he said that our goal is not to merge into God through some fading away or in some divine ocean. Kierkegaard felt that he who does not involve himself with God in the mode of absolute devotion does not really become involved with God. A second-hand relationship with God is like falling in love at second hand. He said, even if I have been mistaken on this or that point, God is nevertheless love. Commenting on our commercial age, he said that a revolutionary age is an age of action, while ours is the age of advertisement and publicity. When people or when a generation live merely for finite ends, life becomes a whirlpool, meaningless, and either a despairing arrogance or a despairing anguish. The one who is called must stand alone, walk alone, alone with God. To believe is not an indifferent relationship to something that is true. It is an infinitely decisive relationship. The accent always falls on relationship. Unhappiness is not to love without being loved, but to be loved when one does, when one does not have love. Kierkegaard says that to leave out the strenuous passages in the New Testament is now the method. We hush them up and arrange things on easier and cheaper terms. 
Now, after the modern age came the postmodern age. There has been a split between liberal reformers and postmodernists on the one hand, and religious fundamentalists on the other. The basic split is on whether the world is fair and people get what they deserve. When people see good people suffer, they think there cannot be a God because a good God would not allow suffering like this to exist. Religious fundamentalists, on the other hand, believe that anyone who rejects their version of God is a rebel against God and deserves the suffering they get. The godly will be rewarded in heaven and the ungodly will be punished in hell. Some people are seen as rejecting God so they don't deserve any consideration at all. The liberal reformers and postmodernists see this view as intolerance and so lose all respect for religion. Looking ahead to this, William Butler Yeats said in The Second Coming that the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. The magazine Prabhuda Bharata recently featured a speech by Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, who is an example of postmodernism. Her mother helped establish the Sarada Mat. Her father was a doctor who sacrificed career goals when refusing to lie at a trial, which sounds familiar because Takor's father did the same thing. He gave charitable, tre charitable treatment to his patients. He protected his Muslim students from riots, and they in turn protected him. He was initiated by Sri Sarada Devi. Yet when Spivak came to New York, she ended up telling Swami Pavitrananda that she had lost her faith. He said to her, Gayatri, where will you escape? Your focused study is your way to the sacred. As a result, she understood Jacques Derrida's idea that reading is a species of prayer to be haunted by the text as a consequence of the Swami's remark. Spivak had Paul DeMann as a mentor at Cornell University. One idea the man had is that we all have blind spots. Jacques Derrida, who Spivak introduced to the English-speaking world, felt that there are no guarantees that the ethics of reading will not fall prey to the very structure of violence from which it attempts to escape. For postmodernists, this means that there is a fear that while we intend to solve a problem, our blind spot may lead us into the very problem we are trying to resolve. Another way I have come to think of this is that Maya can, could be considered to be a big blind spot, and that knowing that we have blind spots should encourage us to have faith. Spivak's contribution to postmodernism and deconstruction was to uphold the point of view of what she calls the subaltern, or the oppressed woman of the third world. She points out the, that English literature, as taught both in the West and in the colonies was intended to further the goals of imperialism. Even before I was introduced to Spivak's work, it occurred to me one day that Sri Ramakrishna never complained about the British rule in India. In fact, he seemed to ignore it completely. The only time I recall Sri Sarada Devi commenting on the British was to say that the British were her children too. While Spivak makes post-colonial studies the focus of her work, it seems that the Ramakrishna movement seeks a spiritual solution and sees the ego as our enemy rather than any human beings, political systems, or political forces. I read a book entitled Sons of Abraham by a rabbi and an imam who are trying to develop understanding between Jews and Muslims. The rabbi, Mark Schneer, says that, I am an Orthodox rabbi who believes that my orientation, my belief, my point of view is what works best for me. But there is not only one path, not in religion and not in the rest of life. The Imam, Shamsi Ali, quotes from the Quran, to each among you, we have prescribed a law in an open way. If Allah had so willed, he would have made you a single people. They point out that Jewish oral law in the Talmud has softened some of the harsher elements of the Torah so that struggle against other peoples is considered to mean a struggle against unreligious elements in oneself. And similarly, 
the highest jihad in Islam is considered to be a struggle within oneself rather than a struggle against other peoples. Muhammad's sayings were interpreted to encourage conquest only after he had passed away. While he was alive, he was only in, while when he was alive, he was only involved in a defensive warfare to defend religious rights. A hadith, or a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, is quoted as saying, Beware, whoever is cruel and hard on a non-Muslim minority or, excuse me, or curtails their rights or burdens them with more than they can bear or takes anything from them against their free will, I, Prophet Muhammad, will complain against that person on the day of judgment. Both the rabbi and the imam emphasize that they support ethical monotheism, so it is not clear how they feel about religions where God is worshipped through images and whether they would be as open-minded towards them. But I did realize after I got my talk all together that the rabbis Arthur Green and Rami Shapiro are sympathetic to Vedanta, so I could have done some research on them if I had thought about it in time. I have recently, excuse me, I have recently gotten on an email list called BookBub, and each day there's a book or two that you can buy for a dollar or two to read online. One of the books I got was called, and most of them turned out to be Christian books, although it says they're just religious books. One of the books I got was called 10 Questions Every Christian Must Answer, Thoughtful Responses to Strengthen Your Faith by Alex McFarland and Elmer Towns. Although they try, they don't do what Kierkegaard did and that just emphasize the will, they emphasize coming up with a rational argument for every aspect of their belief. But they go so far as to say that people who go to eternal hell want to be separated from God and thus choose to go there. But still, Elmer Towns describes his personal experience with Jesus. I knelt by my bed looked into heaven, and I prayed, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. I instantly surrendered all. Whereas those words had never worked previously, this time I experienced an inner explosion of joy and peace and thrill I had never felt. I knew Jesus had come into my life, and I knew I was saved, just as surely as a previously blind man knows light when he sees it for the first time. Thus, behind all the rational arguments is a personal experience of connection with God, which is what Kierkegaard was stressing as the important thing. Despite their narrow interpretation, we can all have such an experience, whatever our path. Another book I got from BookBub was A Christian Survival Guide by Ed Cizewski. This book is intended to shore up people's faith. Aside from the fact that Cizewski is prejudiced against idols and the Pharisees, a lot of his ideas remind me of Vedanta. He says that the meaning of the word translated as day in the Bible does not necessarily encompass 24 hours, so that evolution is a compatible idea. And he also says that the eternal fires of Gehenna, later translated as hell, where the fire is constantly burning in a garbage dump and do not necessarily mean eternal damnation. He says the idea of eternal hell was propagated in the days when Christianity had the absolute power of the state and was used to keep people in control. He says that the point of scripture is that God will judge evil and bring justice to our world, and it is not up to us. He says that most Christians I know care more about the reality of Christ in their, day to, in their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. While the reliability of the Bible is important to them, a historically accurate book is not a substitute for the present power of God in their lives. He also says, oftentimes the most destructive aspects of Christianity for those growing up in the church are tied to a failure of Christians to discern which aspects of the Bible are linked to another cultural time and place. These ideas are very similar to the Vedantic ideas of forming a connection to the chosen ideal and distinguishing between Shruti and Smriti. 
Kaczewski says that although Jesus told one person to give away all possessions, Jesus was supported by a group of wealthy women and that his advice was geared to the individual. And he also says, even if we tithe, we can get into trouble with what we do with the rest of our money and worship money as a god. To get back to our dilemma of choosing between fanatical ideals or mundane compromise, the conflict between having an ideal and embracing compromise assumes that we are going to remain limited by our ego. The mystical religions of Hinduism and Buddhism as well as the mystics and other religions, go beyond this. They claim that the ego is ultimately not a real element. There is a state beyond the ego called samadhi nirvana, or the peace that passeth understanding. In Vedanta, this state is said to be existence, knowledge, and bliss. While Marx said that philosophers have only interpreted the world, the point is to change it, mystics might say, that political activists have only reshuffled the world, the point is to re-experience it. How to re-experience it? Sri Ramakrishna said that God is the only reality. If we think of the, wor of the world as real, we will find inevitable frustration. Our actions become habits that bind us to the world in lifetime after lifetime. We have our karma which means that if we sacrifice now, we can indulge later, and if we indulge now, we will have to sacrifice later. But the ultimate goal is to, to transcend both good and evil, both sacrifice and indulgence, and reach the non-dual state, which is said to be bliss itself. Does this mean we ignore the world altogether? Social activists say that we need to change the system to make real change, but we have seen that any system based on the ego is bound to have problems. The idea of dharma in Hinduism means to live righteously. We may have pleasure in some stages of life, but this is only to prove to oneself that these pleasures are ultimately unsatisfactory. We must conduct our lives and our work lives in a righteous manner. Sri Ramakrishna asked a philanthropist if, when he saw God, he would ask for schools and hospitals or would he ask for liberation? He felt that what the philanthropist Vidyasagar was doing was good, but that he needed to go beyond it. When a devotee was going to a labor movement function, Sri Ramakrishna said it would be better for him to stay and absorb the bliss of the spiritual gathering. Yet Swami Vivekananda interpreted Sri Ramakrishna's idea that we need to serve others as meaning that we cannot offer religion to people who are starving. We do not need to do social activism to change the system, nor need we give to charity to build a name for ourselves. According to Swami Vivekananda, the goal of serving others is to serve God in humanity or Shiva in Jiva. We need to develop a relationship with God first and then try to do good to the world. As Lord Krishna said in the Bhagavad Gita, we have the right to our work, but not to the fruits of our work. Swami Vivekananda said in his book, Karma Yoga, that we should work for work's sake. Swami Chetananda says, talking about Swami Vivekananda, according to Vedanta, God dwells in all beings, so Swamiji taught his disciples to worship God within humanity. For example, one should worship the illiterate with education, the hungry with food, the sick with medicine, and a proper diet, the sick with medicine and a proper diet, and the rich with spirituality. And just this afternoon, I, in this book for a dialogue with Hinduism, which is a Catholic book put out for a dialogue with Hinduism, um, Ramana Maharshi, when he was asked what solution he had for the pressing problems of poverty, illiteracy, disease, war, etc., he used to ask in return, have you reformed yourself first? What he meant by this was that social action, as in every kind of altruistic work, social, that in social action, as in every kind of altruistic work, 
self-gratification of the ego and egoism should be shunned and that the criterion of service to others should be the reduction of the ego. Pramod Kumar writes in the Vedanta Keshari, it is an erroneous notion popularized by colonial historians that Hinduism is otherworldly and therefore did not encourage its followers to serve and contribute. The householder was the economic pillar of Indian society who supported people in all the other phases of life. The other phases were the student, retiree, and sannyasin. Kumar also points out that when the demons, the humans, and the gods went before Prajapati and were told one syllable of advice, da, while the gods interpret it as the need for restraint and the demons as the need for mercy, the humans interpreted it as a need to be charitable. So each group interpreted it to counteract their major flaw. Yet the educational policies which India adopted after independence were completely divorced from the ideals of Dharma and Seva. There is no ultimate progress in the world because it is a mixture of good and bad that are also always needed to balance each other out. The historical religions believe that a Messiah will come to perfect the world, but the mystical religions see the world as an endless chain going around in a circular motion. For the proponents of a historical religion, there is a prominent reason to do good, and that is to win God's favor. It might mean the difference between going to heaven and going to hell. For proponents of mystical religions, though, the reason to do good is ultimately because it is our nature to do good. The libertarians, the communists, the reactionaries, and the anarchists are all trying to do good in their own way. Yet they are hampered by the ego. Professor Sengupta, in a talk he gave here, said that in times like those of the Pandavas versus the Kauravas, one side was predominantly good and one side was predominantly bad. Today, he said, there is good and bad in all of us. Our goal, as Sri Ramakrishna said, is to remove the thorn of evil with the thorn of good and then to discard both thorns. People who meditate are sometimes said to be focusing on themselves and not caring about others. But if meditation can help remove our tendencies toward greed, anger, and pride, while activism may increase those tendencies, which is really the most unselfish. The poet William Blake said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite. Swami Vivekananda says, Sri Ramakrishna is a force. You should not think that his doctrine is this or that. And Prabhupada Sridhatma Prana pointed out that initiation plants a seed in us it started with Sri Ramakrishna and has been passed down all the way to us. Swami Tyagananda says, what matters is who I am. Am I free from anger, hate, from hatred, anger, jealousy, fear, and selfishness? Do I love and help others with no thought of self-interest? If yes, then I can go ahead and call myself either spiritual or religious or neither of the two. Results matter. Labels don't. The whole point of this exploration of different political and religious paths is to show that all of our calculations lead us back to the need to depend on God, develop a relationship with God, and realize God. Sri Ramakrishna said in the Gospel, Hasra is given, too much, given to too much calculation. He says, this much of God has become the universe, and this much is in the balance. My head aches at his calculation. I know that I know nothing. Sometimes I think of God as good, and sometimes as bad. What can I know of him? He also said in the gospel, I used to pray to her in this way, O mother, O blissful one, reveal thyself to me. Thou must. Again, I would say to her, 
O Lord of the lowly, O Lord of the universe, surely I am not outside thy universe. Except of knowledge, I am without discipline, I have no devotion, I know nothing. Thou must be gracious and reveal thyself to me. And while I don't believe all of that applied to him, it certainly applies to me. Sri Ramakrishna said what he said for our benefit. And if we can attain one sixteenth of what he attained, or even less, we can give up our reliance on calculation and see what we have in common with each other. Ultimately, we will find that we are all one. Now I will end with the song by the Beatle George Harrison that he did after he was in the Beatles. Mary McDonough on the website Rock and Theology says, One day, Ravi Shankar gave George Harrison a book that changed his life. Written by Swami Vivekananda, one particular quote caught Harrison's attention, and this is it. If there is a God, you must see him, and if there is a soul, we must perceive it. Otherwise, it is better not to believe. It's better to be an outspoken atheist than a hypocrite. Excuse me. This notion of having a direct experience with God inspired Harrison to delve deeper into religion. So the song called Life Itself will play while the offertory is collected. I'm 